Yeah, they're going to Thunder Run and the uh, um, new bit. But they weren't going to go up until lunch. I'm thoroughly enjoying this one. I'm learning so much. Yeah.
the road is a glider one. <laughs> and there was curtain call after curtain call. And then a woman came down the center aisle holding something and handed it to the conductor, who handed it to the first violin, who handed it to the woodwind, who leant up and handed it, and Domingo leant down and picked it up. It was an empty bottle of Newcastle brown <laughs> ale with a single red rose in it. And the audience went mad. Our shoulder blades were against the wall and I felt the building shake. And there were 17 curtain calls at that point. And I know, save in your presence, I'll never have an experience like that in this theatre. So that was something that was special. Now, this session is called Beyond Britain. It's a rather Britain beyond us, because by coincidence, and sad as this, we're not having the speaker from Stockholm, all three speakers are going to be speaking about North America. And so this is Britain going abroad, in a sense, because there's scholars in British theatre, though one, of course, the first speaker, she is American. And Mike Hume, of course, is Scottish, Third is English, of course. You are English, aren't you? Canadian. Canadian. <laughs> Canadian. <laughs> That's a That's a so there we are. We're a mixed nation. We're going to talk about. All we're going to talk about. Yes. Sorry. We're all going to talk about American theatre of the same period as this theatre. Why am I here? Because I, I travelled a bit in my professional life. I should. Have Hasten to add, I'm not an architect. I never trained in anything I did in my life. First as a producer of the Prospect Theatre Company, and then later on as a design consultant. I don't believe in education, really. I believe that Lady Bracknell was right when she said, ignorance is a delicate, fr exotic fruit. Touch it and the... <laughs> touch it and the... Bloom. 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 Thank you. The <laughs> go has gone. So I never learned about anything at all. But what I've learned about things, I've learned through conferences, very much so. And I'm lucky enough to be a guest speaker around the world. And I've always enjoyed conferences and enjoyed learning things for the first time. <coughs> and if you are kind enough to buy my book, there's a bit chapters learning from this country, learning from that country, and I mean learning. And so I find conferences always something new, and this is why I'm here. And I, uh, America, four th favorite theaters, I did one in Calgary, one in Westminster School, Connecticut, one in Toronto, and I did the whole of that. But we all were successful theaters me working with a good architect who'd never done the theatre before, so hence the dialogue took place. And by this way of working with fellow professionals, one learns something. So I'm going to look forward enormously to what the three speakers are going to say. So I'd like to introduce the first three speakers who've got to know, to the chair of the last session, Wendy.
The discovery of gold in the American River during the winter of 1848 prompted what is now known as the California Gold Rush of 1849, an event that drew people from all over the world. Exorbitant salaries were offered to theater professionals, those willing to brave the journey and perform in very rough settings. It was a series of gold strikes that fueled a national desire to complete the First Continental Railroad, uniting East and West coasts, coasts. The Transcontinental Railroad was completed on May 10, 1869, with the final gold spike driven in at Promontory Summit in Utah. The arduous cross-country um, journey was from New York to San Francisco was reduced to seven days by 1870. Thousands of communities were now connected with Chicago, centrally located and situated along the western shores of Lake Michigan, one of the five Great Lakes in a freshwater chain that connects the interior of North America to the Atlantic Ocean. A variety of entertainment venues were constructed in the railway's wake, including the Tabor Opera House. Located in the heart of the Rocky Mountains, the mining town of Leadville, Colorado, was approximately 10,000 feet above sea level. Horace Tabor, nationally known as the Silver King, constructed his flagship opera house in 1879, only a month before the railway arrived in town, which meant everything was delivered by coach. Ample land, abundant funds, and an ever-increasing network of transportation offered seemingly, seemingly endless opportunities for theater manufacturers and supply, suppliers. Demand for painted front curtains, stock scenery collections, stage machinery, and lighting systems outweighed the supply of craftsmen to manufacture them. An abundance of work with high profits drew people from across the country and around the world. Hundreds of other theaters were now being constructed along the railway, prompting Chicago illustrator and printer John B. Jeffrey to publish his first guide and directory to opera houses, theaters, and public halls in 1878. Jeffrey provided practical information for touring groups with detailed information about stage houses, writing, intellectual foreigners have been astounded at the rapidity with which a vast wilderness has been transformed by a nation thickly dotted with centers of industry, commerce, and art. The full extent of this marvelous progress has not been recognized generally as it deserves. The American stage ranks in importance with that of England and France. Jeffrey's Guide was one of many innovations to come out of Chicago during the 1870s, and at the time, Chicago was in the process of rebuilding itself reconstructing the downtown area after the Great Fire. In 1871, disaster struck when fire ravaged three and a half square miles of the downtown area, destroying 17,500 buildings and displacing 100,000 residents. Two decades later, the city hosted the 1893 World Fair. In addition to recognizing the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus's arrival, the Columbian Exposition showed the world that Chicago had risen from the ashes victorious. The rebuilding of Chicago drew thousands of tradesmen to the Midwest. 10,000 building permits were issued between 1872 and 1879 alone. Chicago quickly became an American hub of economic and industrial innovation. The rebuilding of Chicago coincided with shifts in immigration to North America. There were three waves of immigration during the 19th century. The first wave primarily consisted of people from England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Europe. The second wave included an increased number of people from Western and Central Europe, and the third wave lasted from the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century and was mainly composed of people from Eastern Europe and Russia. And I have to say, I'm the product of the second and third waves of immigration. With access to Western lands and opportunities, immigrants arrived in Chicago by droves. What this means is that there was a demographic shift where we transfer from a waterway network, which is how people are distributed throughout the country, to a railway network, as is exhibited on the two slides. This meant the demographic shift occurred as the railway exponentially increased. 
Parker's Weekly from 1874 illustrated Germans boarding a steamer for, steamer for the United States. German emigration peaked between 1881 and 1885 when a million Germans arrived, mainly settling in the Midwestern United States. And how this um, basically affected the Glasgow like is that you have primarily um, British Isles now being displaced by German immigration. So even in 2010, you can see the red area, which is referred to as the German Belt, and this also directly ties into our political and social um, demarcation in the United States. The large swath that cuts across the country, known as the German Belt, is still very prominent in the way that Midwesterners speak, the way that the Northwesterners speak, and how that travels across in the custom, customs and halls. By 1890, 80% of all Chicago's citizens were either foreign-born or children of immigrants. From a theater history perspective, this made Chicago a melting pot of stagecraft. Two distinct scenic painting traditions dominated the productions of painted illusion in Chicago at this time. The English method of transparent glazing, which is on your left side. It's just like stage right. Um, and then also the continental method of opaque washes. So for another example, on, on your left is an example of the English method, a painted detail by William Thompson Russell Smith, otherwise known as Russell Smith, for the Thalian, the Thalian Hall in Wilmington, North Carolina, dated 1858. This was the stylistic approach that many scenic artists in the Eastern theaters, including Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and the Eastern Seaboard employed. On the right is an example of the Continental Method, a painted detail by James E. Lamphere for the Tabor Opera House in Leadville, Colorado in 1879. Note that the English, trans the English glazes take a light colored background and work up the subject with um, a series of applying darker glazes to the top. Obviously not with every subject, but it's the traditional approach, whereas the Continental Method We'll start with a darker background and define the object by light. These two schools of scenic art, translucent glazes and opaque washes, were publicly argued for and against in the 19th century in periodicals. Um, in 1889, an article published in Theatre Magazine, written by W.J. Lawrence, lamented the loss of the English tradition as it was being displaced um, by especially Germany, France, and the newer American artists. He said, the days of glazing and second painting are gone forever. What matters is the adoption of the broadest system of treatment possible, working slapdash fashion in full body colors. Interestingly, the English tradition of frame painting continued. It remained the per preferred method in the United States until the 1920s. Here's an illustration um, created by American scenic artist Charles Graham for Harper's Weekly in 1878. Um, Charles Green was a Chicago scenic artist, so we know that he had a very uh, familiar <coughs> understanding of the stage, and he was later named the official illustrator for the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. Here are two examples that illustrate the difference, in case you're unfamiliar with it, between the English method of scene painting on a vertical frame and the continental method of painting on the floor. The 19th century American scenic artists uh, favored the use of vertical frames. Much had to do with the design of the theaters, allowing scenic artists to only access their work from the stage, as there was simply not enough floor space, and, and that was too valuable of a property. Even after scenic studios built their, or, um, their own structures, they continued with frame painting because you were able to accommodate many more paint frames within a limited space. And I always include women painting in my presentations as they were often left out of many of the history books. As with people of color, they were present, just not colored. It is important to understand that both floor and frame painting necessitated a different approach, although both used as temper paint, which is also known as size painting, and similar brushes. Each method determined the economy of the brushwork. Here is an example of floor painting in the Continental Method featuring French sonographer Auguste Rivet. Um, and the next, just to give you a sense, is an example of the English method featuring an American scenic artist, Thomas Gibbs Moses, 
Um, I paint both up and down, trained in the distemper paint method, recognizing that each tradition has its strengths. That being said, it is far easier when you are 90 years old or much older to paint vertically where the composition is here versus down. So to understand the distemper, distemper painting, distemper paint was the traditional artistic medium for the stage, solely consisting of two ingredients, pure color, the dried pigment, as you can see in the outside circle, and binder, the dried hide glue. Dry pigment powder was transformed into a wet pulp prior to mixing it with binder, and in some cases it arrived at the studio in a wet pulp versus um, a block to be ground. The hide glue that it was mixed with requires cooking and is diluted with water to create size. Strong size, which was a one-to-one -one ratio, was applied to the fabric and that's what prepared the fibers for paint. It was further diluted to use working size, which what was mixed with the pigment um, paste on the palette. And in order to know the correct consistency, because there is no exact formula, it's you dip your fingers in, in the glue, you shake off your fingers, and you wait until you get that perfect pop. It's very much like baking or mixing board. Um, and here's an example of an American scenic artist palette filled with bowls of pigment paste. The paste and sized water were mixed together and then immediately applied to the fabric, and this is what gives you some of the color variations. It remained the standard methodology for North American scenic art until the mid-20th century. The scenic artist had to intimately know each color, as the wet paint applied to the backdrop would dry several shades lighter. In other words, it returns to its dry color form. So the artist is working solely from memory. Here's an example of wet paint versus how much lighter it dries. And it was a strategic combination of colors applied by a skilled hand that resulted in stunning composition that transported generations of theater audiences to distant locales. Distemper paint is quite different from premixed paints used by contemporary scenic artists as it fully permeates each underlying layer and there is not a continued buildup of each successive layer. Very little pigment is needed for the distemper painting process. Actually, the key to this is how little pigment can you actually apply to the canvas while making it look opaque. This means that many distemper backdrops could also function as translucencies. The image on the right is the same as that viewed from the back side of the drop. The original paint layer was quite thin, creating opportunities for backlighting. It also meant that distemper scenes could be easily folded and packed into touring trunks. Additionally, when lit from behind, an entirely new range of colors is revealed, affecting the atmosphere of the scene without the necessity of colored lights. Um, and this means that with just even a white light to illuminate it pushing through, you will get the underlay of colors as it, it starts to reflect. Okay, today I have written hundreds of biographies about scenic artists working in North America, tracing their lineage to various countries. This is what I do in my spare time because it's my passion. For today's presentation, I'm briefly going to touch on Harley Mary, who painted in the English tradition in New York. Harley Mary was the name for Ebenezer Britton, 1844 to 1914. He began his theatrical career as both an actor and scenic artist working in the theaters of London, Norfolk, Edinburgh, and Glasgow. It is relatively easy to trace his early theatrical career in newspapers from the time. In 1864, he married Louisa Maria Raven Rowe, who went by the stage name Adelaide Russell or Adelaide Rizzo. After immigrating to the United States in 1869, although some place it as early as 1867, the Marys worked all over the country with Harley Mary painting scenery for theaters in New Orleans, St. Louis, Memphis, Chicago, Philadelphia, and settling in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and this goes to show, as he was arriving with many of the scenic artists from other countries, it was prompted by easy access to hundreds of theaters that were being constructed and an abundance of work. Um, Mary permanently settled in New York, where he operated an extremely successful studio with his sons um, until his passing in 1914. He was also a major um, influence in amusement park attractions, especially those on Coney Island in New York, 
as well as producing the early scenery for Edison films. He was extremely influential in the development of American theater from both a performance and a production perspective. In America, Mary helped establish the Actors' Order of Friendship, joining Edwin Booth and Lawrence Barrett in 1888 to lobby Congress against the importation of foreign productions. He was also instrumental in establishing the American Society of Scene Painters in 1892. The group, this group that he um, joined with, including Henry Hoyt, Sidney Chidley, um, Ernest Elbert, and Richard Marston, were uh, representative of the English School of Scenic Art. Three years later, the American Society of Scene Painters gave rise to the Protective Alliance of Scene Painters of America in 1895, where Mary was elected the organization's first president, and this drew scenic artists from all over the country, including both the English and continental traditions. In short, it prevented stage employees from handling any scenery except that painted by members of the Alliance, stirring up a little excitement among the English managers. Um, in 1896, and this is one of my favorite quotes of all time, when members were gathered in their lodge rooms to install officers, the following statement was received. If George Edwards brings a shipload of scenery from England to America, he will not be able to get a single scene shifter or carpenter in New York to handle it, and the orchestra will not even play slow music. For that matter, no piece of scenery painted by a non-union man will be handled in any of the large cities in this country. We have to protect ourselves against the hordes of fresco men who dabble for a farthing, and some managers who care nothing for the art, only making money. This organization truly bridged the gap between the two schools of scene painting as artists from across the country united for a common cause. In addition to Mary's legislative legacy, his artistic legacy continued from one generation to the next. One brief example was the studio established by two of his students, Walter Burridge and Ernest Albert. They partnered with Oliver Dennett Grover in 1890 to construct an astonishing scenic studio by 1891, measuring approximately 15,000 square feet. And as the brochures mentioned, after a scene is painted, it can be hung, set, and lit in an open space, the full size of any stage in the country. So the manager can not only inspect it in its entirety and thus, um, and thus suggest alterations, but he can also bring his company to the scenic studio to rehearse with the new scenery. Amazingly, they went bankrupt, I think from probably suggestions that were employed after seeing it up. This was a period in American theater history that denoted a distinct shift in the manufacture and distribution of painted scenery. There was a transition from scenery being painted by an itinerant scenic artist on site to a scenic studio of artists mass producing and shipping scenery by rail. No American studio better exemplifies this shift than Sossman and Landis. Joseph S. Sossman and Perry Landis met and began working as itinerant artists in 1876. By 1879, they saved enough money to open a scenic studio in Chicago. Between the summers of 1881 and 1882, the firm delivered scenery to 74 theaters across the country. And I mean across the country, not in the region. Then they established regional offices in New York, Detroit, Kansas, and St. Louis. The success of Sossman and Landis was based on a stream of highly skilled scenic artists with national reputations coming in to do what they did best, and leaving. This cut down on the studio's overhead while securing name recognition from the beginning. Over time, the studio became a factory with the main studio staff, annex studio staffs during periods of high productivity, in addition to all the regional offices, and road crews that painted scenery on site for installations. By 1894, they had delivered scenery to 4,000 stages. By 1902, Sossman and Landis delivered scenery to 6,000 stages in the United States, Canada, Mexico, the Caribbean, and South Africa. And this is not including their touring shows for Buffalo Bill, for Al Ringling, and the list goes on. Madame Majeska, it's quite remarkable. They produced painted spectacle for a variety of popular entertainment venues, including moving panoramas, cycloramas, 
grand circus spectacles, Wild West shows, amusement park attractions, industrial exhibits, charity events, and more. They knew the stagecraft and how to produce painted scenery well. And this is a picture of their studio from 1910. In addition, during their reign, Chicago became the largest theatrical manufacturer and supplier in the country because it had shifted from the East Coast after the fire to the Midwest to be able to distribute, and then it would shift back with the onset of Coney Island and the buildup of Broadway. Um, Sossman and Landis also diversified. They did not just produce painted spectacle. They um, created the American Reflector and Lighting Company, as well as the theatrical management firm of Sossman, Landis, and Hunt. They ran both theaters and stock companies. Sossman and Landis even purchased manufacturing firms such as the Tennessee Pottery Company so that they were able to directly source materials for their lighting equipment. Over the past few years, I have identified 113 Sossman and Landis employees tracing their lives and careers. Although this is only a very small fraction of their employees, and I'm guessing it's about 2% of the people they hired, it exhibits unprecedented diversity in American theater industry. The Sossman and Landis Steenix Studio was the proverbial melting pot of stagecraft a successful blend of old world and new world traditions and innovations. Here is a list of 19 of the Sossman and Landis scenic artists who were born overseas in England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, Denmark, Sweden, and the German Empire, both Prussia and Bavaria. Here is a list of 13 of the first generation scenic artists, the children of immigrants, who were Bavarian, Polish, Czech, Dutch, English, French, and French and German. Again, they are the artist, artists who I've confirmed representing, again, a small fraction. And then with the with corresponding map so that you can see it. 17 employees that I've written about came from families who had been in the country for quite some time, but they had been raised in the East, in the states of Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and New York, trained in the English method and with a corresponding map so you can tell the area where I'm talking about. 35 of the scenic artists that I've written about were born and raised in the Midwestern states of Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, Iowa, Missouri, Kansas, and Nebraska, part of the German belt, raised on farms, and children of local merchants. These individuals are the scenic artists who were trained in both the English and continental methods, many with the hybrid of using opaque washes on vertical frames. Um, and again, this is a blend of techniques that were brought from artists from all over the world. And with a corresponding map, so you can see the majority coming from Illinois, where Chicago is located. Um, please, in, please understand that these lists I focus on scenic artists, and they don't include the dozens of stage carpenters, mechanics, seamstresses, salesmen, and other office staff who worked at Sossman and Landis and the branch offices. Statistically, thousands of scenes painted by 19th century scenic artists remain scattered across North America, with many tucked away in storerooms, under stages, or above auditorium rafters. They are primary sources for future generations of theater scholars and practitioners alike to study. These historic artifacts not only represent the legacy of American scenic artists, but also the legacy of immigrant artists on their homelands. This is such a passionate project for me because it brings us together as a world of theater practitioners and scholars. So, before I get too teary, that is it. Thank you so much.
honored to be on a panel with Wendy and with Mike. Uh, and what, which is, it's like a dream. It's something you wake me up and you tap me on the shoulder and say, get out of here. Um, when this came up, I was, I was really very involved with uh, exploring the headwaters of the Cavalry Treatment System. I had to take time out of that to put this together. And I thought, well, what, what would be of interest? Well, this theater was built in 1867, so how about a theater that was built at about th that time in the United States? Now, as Wendy already indicated, just with Sauceman and Landis, 6,000 theaters that they, equip, they alone equipped, uh, there were hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of theaters. Columbus, Indiana, nobody's heard of Columbus, Indiana, right? Columbus, Indiana, 20,000 people back in the 1860s. Five theaters. So, so they, they, there were just theaters all over the place. There was no radio, there was no television. And I, I lit upon the Booth's Theater uh, because, uh, well, it's associated with the Booth family, which I'll tell you a bit about them. And uh, I was pleased about the two, I was pleased about one thing, just pleased about another. Pleased about, actually, there was a lot of innovation in Booth's Theater that wasn't happening in, uh, well, very much in the rest of the country at that time. Uh, the disappointing part was the dearth of information available, almost nothing. Uh, before we start, um, my slides seem to be out of order, I apologize. Okay, um, this is uh, Junius Brutus Booth, he's the father. First, he was, he was very popular. Uh, I, I don't know whether I would say famous, but he was very popular. Uh, this is Junius Booth Jr. Uh, he also was an actor, uh, popular, but uh, hardly famous. And then there's uh, Edwin Booth, second son. And Edwin Booth was probably at the, uh, the displayed the height of the family. Uh, it's after, it's, Booth's Theater is named for Edmund Booth. Ho however, the most infamous son was John Wilkes Booth, who assassinated President Kennedy. Uh, Lincoln, sorry. <laughs> assassinated uh, President Lincoln and uh, dies after a shootout in a barn. Uh, he was captured and, and died from his wounds. Uh, so he's the most infamous. Um, now, Booth's theater, you'll notice, is in the possessive. Now, this, this is the slide I expected a little bit earlier. As opposed to the Booth Theater. Now, both are named for Edwin Booth, but the Booth Theater was built in 1913 and exists today. We are not looking at the Booth Theater. We're looking at Booth's Theater. This is a photograph of Booth's Theater. I, I'm just going to say, I might just say Booth's moving forward. So Booth's Theater. Uh, it's on the corner of uh, 6th Avenue and 23rd Street, southeast corner. And uh, from this, we have to deduce a lot. Uh, I've got a couple of sub, uh, sub themes here. We've got, the, we've got the topic, which is Booth's Theater, and then we've got themes. One of the themes is the challenge of secondary sources. Most, uh, this photograph is the only primary source of infor information we have. This is the only thing that we can look, point at, and say that is Booth's. Uh, everything, uh, our source of most other information is secondary source, and it's an article called Behind, Below, and About the Scenes from Appleton's Journal from 1870. Appleton's Journal was an American magazine that tried to cover everything, science, the arts, uh, uh, literature, and Appleton's journal was the source for many other people that wrote, but Appleton's journal, okay, they were in there, the, the, the person that wrote the article was in Booth's theater, but what he wrote was problematic, and we'll deal with, we'll deal with that as we look on. Um, and I just want to stop for the second theme that runs through this. And, and it, it's, it's a topic, you being the time theater and opera house, are an 
example of, you've got the primary source right here. You've got the primary source in, in uh, photographs, you've got, the you've got a lot of primary source information. And the theme is, wow, maintain that. I don't have to tell you that because you're already doing that. It's wonderful to have the primary source. We have very little on Booth's theater. Uh, the, the secondary, uh, a secondary coloring source, I, I would call it, no pun intended, by John Green. John, John Green uh, wrote his PhD thesis in 1954, and uh, he wrote about, uh, his thesis was stage rigging in the United States from the colonial period up until 1893. And his source for Booth's was Appleton Journal. But what he also did, because of his extensive research and knowledge, he was able to paint in a lot of what was happening generally. So I, I, it was, it, it was a thesis that took me about a week and a half to read because it was so difficult to read and uh, I could read two or three hours at a time. Um, the other s source is newspaper articles from the time. Uh, New York Herald, New York Times, uh, Brooklyn, I forget uh, the name. Maybe it'll come up in a moment. So really, we've got this photograph, we've got Appleton's Journal, and then we've got newspaper articles. Now, this is Brooklyn Daily Eagle, that's the Brooklyn paper. Now, the stage will be very large, being about 50. Now, now confusion, okay? This creates confusion. The stage will be very large, being about 59 feet. What? And in length, 75 feet. What? While the height will be fully 50 feet. Um, the frontage on 23rd Street will be 184 feet. Now, go back to the image, that's the long side. Um, the height from the sidewalk will be 70 feet to the base of the massive con cornice, and above this will be the mansard roof of 24 feet. So, uh, going in the image to our left, that's 184 feet, and every article said, and four inches. <laughs> the front is only 80 feet. This might be, I, I might be wrong, it might be 88 feet, but it, it, I, I believe it was 80 feet. And so the stage, according to what's written here, I'm sorry, what you've got up there, I've got down here. Uh, the stage being a width of 59 feet, so 60 feet, so they only had 10 feet of wings on each side? Rick asks the question. Does that make sense? Maybe it does. Uh, the length of 75 feet, does that mean depth? Um, I, I think, but how do we get 75 feet of depth here? Maybe we have. Um, so, okay, so we've got some dimensions, but they are confusing. And uh, interesting, 72 feet to the bottom of the cornice uh, up above, and then 24 feet of mansard roof. And so this all becomes relevant in, in terms of the discussion of the stage and machinery. Um, the, the, the mansard roof, sorry, it's a masonry building with timber interior construction, except for the mansard roof, which apparently was steel framed. When we take a look at images, there's no steel framing to be seen, which suggests that all of the stage house ended at the cornice and did not go up to the mansard roof, which again defies logic. Why wouldn't they avail themselves of that space? Let's go on. 66 feet to the fly gallery. I, I'm sorry, I forget my source for this. I think it was Appleton. 66 feet to the fly gallery, which means that uh, if the cornice is 72 feet, the fly gallery is six feet below the cornice. Again, is it terminology? Going back to the theme of secondary sources. We've got somebody, did this, did, did this fellow write about uh, Booth's Theater one day and then cover funerals the next day? How much did he know about uh, theaters? Uh, he does say that there's a second fly gallery below the first fly gallery which makes me suspect he's, he's not right on his terminology. 
Now, to, just to put that into perspective, in researching for uh, the, nobody looks up the history of the cavalry reading system, mm -hmm. terminology changes over time too. So just, so, uh, just questioning, what, what, what are we talking about, what are we reading? Now this is interesting, not a rope is to be employed on the stage, in place will be supplied by stout wire cable. Well, that's confusing. Uh, it does not have a counterweight system. Uh, e even Green laments the, the fact that it doesn't have a counterweight system. So who, how did they handle those wires? Now it says, not a rope to be employed on the stage. So he's saying, this, this reporter, from the Daily Eagle is saying, it's all wire rope. Uh, we're gonna come back to the wire rope in a moment. Uh, the carpenter shop will be in a vault under the street. And the painter's gallery, dressing room, storehouse for scenes properties are to be in an adjoining building constructed for their uses. New ropes, and pulleys and machinery and mechanics led to occasional delay, but never to disaster. <laughs> Again, out of a whole argue about the review, or a whole article about the review, and the article was only like a, a three column inches. Um, that's the only thing they said about the machinery. Um, but they mentioned ropes instead of wire ropes or cable. Now, this is out of Appleton's. Okay, so everything we've looked at now is being text secondary source. Now we're looking at uh, engravings. Uh, in 1869, indoor photography was not thing, a thing, especially, it, technically we couldn't do it, especially when we got into expanses. We, we could maybe take shots of individuals in, in front of a backdrop. So I, I look at this and I'm saying, well, what, what am I looking at? Uh, it's, it's not primary source material, but it, it's Somebody was there on site and drew this. So it's as good as we get. And when I first look at this, in the upper left, we can see what appear to be building trusses. Now, uh, those scenic pieces, I, I would put at about 28 feet, maybe, in height, and we'll touch on that a little bit more. And so the, the underside of the trusses are maybe another 12 feet, puts us at 40 feet, where we're already talking 72 feet. So again, questions in my mind. What, what can I believe about this secondary source information? Um, then uh, this puts us on the fly gallery. And going back to the issue of wire rope, wire cable, there's, a, there's a, uh, a windlass right there in the bottom left. And there are a number of ropes coming off the windlass. Hmm, isn't that interesting? It's not one rope with a clue, it's multiple ropes. Uh, I'm going to guess that to be downstage, that we are, the, the viewer is, is downstage looking upstage. I don't know that for a fact. Um, I guess that because uh, generally fly floor, uh, well often fly floor was from both sides, but if, if they're, uh, generally they're on the uh, prompt side which is generally stage right, which would place this uh, stage right and the viewer downstage. So if I were to use wire rope anywhere, I would use it on a drum like this. So that kind of makes sense. But we see all this rope on the, on the fly floor deck. You know, it's coiled. This, it, it, I read it, I interpret it as being fi um, natural fiber rope. And so, uh, again, now we have to, we've got secondary <coughs> sources that are arguing with themselves, the, the, what's printed and what's in the diagram. Um, oh good, I did put that here. Now, we, we see the window uh, kind of uh, center left. Uh, it's it's uh, got panes, it's got a, a curved top, and okay, so, where do we have those windows? We, we have them down on first floor level. But we also have them on that second level of windows. So, 
And those windows are paned as well. So we go back there and say, okay, we're, we're three panes down on that. And we go to the third pane down on those windows. If it's 72 feet to the cornice, we're about 10 to 15 feet below the cornice to that place in those windows. I haven't scaled this or anything, and generally I would try to scale it. Um, so our fly floor isn't at 66 feet. Our fly floor, or that, that fly floor as we see it, would be more at uh, 60 or 58 feet. So this, again, the two, the two sources, the two secondary sources, are in conflict with each other. Um, th this is uh, the paint shop, the scene shop. Uh, on the left of this image, we can see somebody's got a vertical drop and painting it. On the right, it appears people, uh, there's a vertical drop as well. And this is out of Appleton's. And so we assume that the artist that drew this was there and saw it. Well, this is another uh, painting of Booth's scene shop. Uh, Charles Witham, uh, who I, name I don't know, Wendy says he's Booth's scenic artist. So Booth's scenic artist is doing an image of the scene shop. And then we've got Appleton's uh, artist doing a scene. And they're not, they don't appear to be the same. For example, uh, there's a window on the wall here on the, on the left image, and there's not a window. Or is it blocked over by that, uh, those paints, uh, that paint is wrapped? Um, so again, we just have to, how, how much can we depend on secondary sources? Um, in, on the left, we've got two uh, uh, paint uh, racks. On the image on the right, we have the one, and doesn't appear to be room for a second <coughs> on, the, on the right, on the right of the image on the right. So again, the, the, the problems of uh, trying to interpret through secondary sources what it is we're looking at. There are three noted innovations, uh, or actually four, came upon the issue of the cable, uh, so there would be four innovations. I, I can't uh, think of another theater in the 1860s that is using wire rope yet. Um, Booth's theater used hydraulics. Um, they have a flat stage, they do not have a rake. And they're using flats as opposed to wings. Now the hydraulics, uh, this, this is out of Appleton's. This is a drawing of a hydraulic ram. Now, for the life of me, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, the use of the ram were to raise scenery, like in the slopes here. And that's one of the things I, I found interesting about the difference between, between this theater and Booth's theater, uh, that you're using uh, windlasses raising, uh, I haven't even seen it yet. I'm, I'm making an assumption, so if I'm assuming incorrectly, please, please uh, correct me. Uh, but you, you're able to raise scenery from below. Booth was doing that. You're doing it manually. He's do, they're doing it with hydraulics. And uh, I cannot understand what, how that is, a hydraulic ramp. And that's the labeling. It's a hydraulic ramp. Uh, again, the issue of dealing with secondary source information, an artist's rendering. Um, this is beneath the stage. Uh, from the deck to the bottom of the basement is 30 feet. You see those little vertical red lines? I assume uh, George there uh, is about six feet tall with his hat. And uh, so I drew a line that was six feet long, and then I uh, copied it and did five of those lines. Uh, do they align to the same place? It doesn't look like it, but I'm prepared to say, okay, that is 30 feet. And so to the left, we appear to have the machinery. And again, studying this, looking at this, trying to discern what it is, I can't. There's just not enough information there. Uh, it, it looks similar to what I expect to be seeing here in, in, uh, under the stage, uh, perhaps a little bit taller, uh, but I don't see how those rams could be there. If, if, the, if the scenery has to go onto a platform driven by the rams, that scenery is going to be 28 feet, so that uh, 28, 30 minus 28 feet, that means you've got uh, two feet to the basement. Well, where are 
the rafts. They would be subterranean, I would suppose. Um, they, they all, uh, sorry, a, a bit of information uh, that I didn't include here. They, they hit bedrock very shortly. They had to blast bedrock to get down. So if they had to blast bedrock, and they had to put hydraulic rams another 30 feet down, nobody talks about it. Uh, they could be compound rams. You see all this peripheral information that one learns, compound rams, uh, uh, cylinders, they, uh, I don't think they were developed yet. And so how did they do this? Information lost to time. Here we are up on fly floor. Um, the, we, what I believe I'm looking at is uh, that I see at the top of the image the underside of drops. Well, this fly floor is not at 66 feet. This fly floor is somewhere lower than 66. I put it at, at the height of the cross, which is 55 feet. Again, going back to those numbers, those numbers don't make sense. Um, here we are on the grid. All these wheels, none of these make sense to me. Um, there's a lot I don't know. But having wheels immediately over the stage, um, wheels of that diameter over the stage. Uh, flats. Th this, uh, they had a flat stage. And to, to use flats, you need a flat stage. Um, to use flats to effectively. And they use stage braces. So th this is out of, I think, Flint's. Um, now here we have, down left, we've got a stage hand uh, working a, a stage brace. So um, th that's interesting, that's important. And they don't have chariots and poles. They are working with flats. Uh, this is uh, a set for Othello at Booth's Theatre. And we can see we're not dealing with uh, wing, wings and, and, and shutters, we're dealing with, with dimensional scenic pieces, uh, which would be flats. And that, uh, there, there was an, an article, I, I <coughs> some writing, I believe it was in, in Appleton's, that you couldn't see into the wings. Every, the scenery extended into the wings. This doesn't extend into the wings, but it does block the view of the wings. So th those are the innovations, and I just, the, the end note that I want to leave, uh, just reiterate is, wow, isn't it nice to have the real thing to experiment as opposed to try to put this together? Thank you very much for your time. Of, of 
theatre or auditorium. But uh, oftentimes we don't have, uh, the, we, we haven't documented the detail behind the curtain. And so that was something I, I, I wanted to do. And um, by chance I ended up at uh, Her Majesty's at the time, uh, as it was at the time, uh, down in London. And saw a lot of the stage machinery there, both below and uh, above the stage. And that kind of set me on, on a course to see the other machinery of, of similar types. Uh, and I, I got over to the Gaiety, I was up at um, the Citizens in Glasgow, and fiercely proud that they had the, the oldest extant stuff up there, and, and they're doing a great job of, of making that accessible in, the, in their long-running uh, renovation project, which we're going to see tomorrow. Um, and then COVID hit and everything stopped. And, and, and I also do a bit of work in Los Angeles with the Historic Theatre Foundation over there. We pivoted in COVID and we started doing Zoom uh, events and talking to people about theatres for free. And uh, some people in the UK got interested and uh, this chap called Alan uh, contacted me from the Time Theatre. And fast forward to post-COVID and my next trip, I made a beeline here to the, the Time Theatre. And I thought I was coming to check the last theatre off the list with um, the understage machinery and, and so on. But over, over the last few years, it's, uh, it's become a bit of a, a special place. And it's the, the theatre uh, that I have come to visit most, actually, out of all those, those theatres. And... Um, in those, in those intervening years, uh, Sir David Wilmore got in touch and he was, he was doing a visit to Los Angeles and his, his daughter lived in this tiny little town uh, in Los Angeles, you know, millions of people that live there. Did I know this town called Hermosa Beach? And I said, David, that's where I live. <laughs> and um, then found out that his daughter was three streets over from <laughs> in, in the metropolis of Los Angeles. So it's a small world. Um, so it was a delight to, lead, to meet David, who I had uh, followed his work for, for, for many years. And over the last few years, I've stopped here in, in the, the, the theatre. And Alan and I catch up for, for dinner, and last year we came to see the panto. And, and I was very amused when the, the usher told Alan to take his programme off the, the balcony rail and uh, had no idea he was speaking to us. So anyway, it was great fun. Um, so all, all that is to say that it's been quite a journey um, being here. And this theatre has grown on me, but it's somewhere you keep gravitating back to. And to see the work that has been going on here, the, the knowledge that has been shared and the work that's been done is, is fantastic. And, and so when a year ago when we started talking about this conference, um, I got in touch with, with Wendy and Rick and didn't really think that we would be on a stage together, but I'm so proud to, to be here with these, these guys presenting. Um, <coughs> And so delighted to, to have made acquaintances with Rachel and all the work that she's done here, and David and Alan in particular. Um, so I uh, just wanted to, to give you a little bit of background on that. And uh, with that, lovely to be on the stage with you as well. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the Auditorium Theatre in Chicago. Um, so, uh, the, to, to, to give you a little bit of background on the Auditorium Theatre, uh, it opened in 1889 and is a huge place. It's, it seats 4,200 people. Um, it has housed up to nearly 10,000 people at one time. Um, but we're going to get in to see some of the details because it was quite an innovation uh, when it came about. So, let's set the scene. Uh, and th there is quite a lot of background just to really understand how, how it got to become what it became. Um, Wendy talked about the Great Fire of Chicago in 1871. Um, this place opened, what, 18 years later. Uh, there was an awful lot of rebuilding and, uh, you know, recovery from the fire uh, that, that was going on. And there was a chap called uh, Ferdinand Peck who was a wealthy Chicago businessman and, and philanthropist. Um, he was a civic-minded soul uh, and a patron of the arts who had a particular focus on making high art available to the working classes. And to that end, he organized the, Grand, the Chicago Grand Opera Festival in 1885. And you can see there that they, they sort of built a bar uh, uh, which they, they held that, that festival in. 
And so following the, the festival and, and sort of provide a more permanent home for, for his ideals, um, Peck and his philanthropic associates envisioned, envisioned a grand new temple for the arts. Uh, they formed the Auditorium Association and intended to replace Chicago's aging music hall, the central music hall that you can see there, uh, with an opera house to rival anything that uh, New York could, could offer, with the vision of this new hall uh, being a meeting place for the working man and the well-to-do. The auditorium building would become just that, but also more. It would go, be, go on to become a symbol of the city's rebuilding success following the, the fire and Chicago's emergence as a cultural centre. So the Auditorium Association worked with Chicago-based architects uh, Dagmar Adler and Lewis Sullivan, and Peck provided much of the funding and the vision. Adler and Sullivan um, went on to design the auditorium building, and, and that was one of the first sort of mixed-use buildings uh, of modern times. It was a theatre, hotel, and offices, and the receipts from the offices and the hotel would subsidize the, the help subsidize the, the theatre. Um, the architectural style of the theatre is Richardsonian, Richardsonian Romanesque, uh, and that's named for the uh, US architect Henry Hobson Richardson. Uh, and it's a revival style based on French and Spanish Romanesque precedents of the 11th century. Um, Richardsonian Romanesque is characterised by massive, rough cut stone walls, dramatic semicircular arches, and deeply recessed windows. And we'll, we'll see a bit of that as, as we go on. Now, this chap, um, Milward Adams, um, he'd been the manager of the music hall that you saw earlier, since 1881, and he was actively involved in this association that he'd set up to build this new hall. Um, shortly before he was appointed to manage the new, the new hall, the new theatre, in 1888, he was travelling to Europe and was sent by the Auditorium Association uh, to Budapest to examine the all-iron hydraulically operated as <coughs> stage system uh, as used in the opera house there uh, to determine if the system would be suitable for the auditorium theatre. So it's clear uh, now that, that we know that Millward uh, clearly favoured the system because a few months later the architect uh, Dagmar Adler and John Bairstow, who for many years was a stage carpenter at the Vicarage Theatre in Chicago, the famous theatre, uh, he was recently appointed to look after the, the stage of the auditorium. Um, they were sent on a follow-up trip to, to Europe. Uh, they were convinced that this system would be ideally suited to the conditions of the auditorium. So the Asphalia system, let's talk about that for a moment. What, what are we talking about here? Um, well, you can see that uh, it comes from the, the, the Greek uh, word there. It was designed by the, a Viennese engineering group, a core of theatrical machinists who formed the Asphalia Society for the production of contemporary theatre. Uh, and their idea here was that this was a way to build stages that put safety first in all areas of theatre production, eliminating as much wood and other flammable materials <coughs> as possible from the construction of stages. And Asphalia is the Greek word for safety. And it's interesting to think about this word safety in the context of uh, the paper that we heard from, from Rachel yesterday, um, and thinking about um, the ability to slow a metal trap from, from rising to the stage, which you could probably do with a, a, a counterweight trap, but I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't want to get in, in the way of an iron trap operated by hydraulics going, going up to the stage. So perhaps it was safe in some ways and not so much in, in other ways. Um, so, although the system was a response to um, the many wooden, fire, wooden stage fires of the 19th century, the main deal that it came out of was the Ring Fire Theatre in 1881, where a gaslight ignition system in the theatre caused an explosion, uh, set the stage on fire, and that spread to the auditorium, and ultimately 400 souls were claimed in that uh, terrible fire. <laughs> So, um, the Asphalia stage machinery system laid the foundation for, the for modernity with hydraulics replacing manual operation, replacing wood with iron. Uh, and that uh, required greater sources of power, hence elaborate hydraulic equipment. Uh, 
Um, the first installation um, was at the Opera House in Budapest that I mentioned in 1884. Um, and it was that installation that the Auditorium Association were attracted by. Now, the, the engraving that you can see on the slide here um, is representative. It's not of a particular theatre that, that I know for sure, so I don't want to say that this is Budapest. But what you're seeing here is the components of the Asphalia system with lifting bridges, tilting bridges, traps with sectioned bridges, and you can see in the back there a wraparound moving cyclorama. Now, um, the system was not without its detractors, and it's clear from this cartoon that it did occasionally go, go wrong. Um, more mishaps than accidents, uh, so far as we, we know, but um, the, the, the newspapers did like to make a little bit of fun of all the things that up and down. So let's talk about how this relates to, to, to this theatre, right? So, so the English Greek stage in the Asphalia system, we all know Mr. Sachs, they are co-author of the magnum opus Modern Opera Houses and Theatres. I think you can buy it out there, actually. Um, he coined the term the English Greek stage to describe the traditional arrangement of traps, slopes, sliders, and bridges, just like we have here at the, the, the Time Theatre. Um, so there we've got a little diagram. You can see all those common uh, components. And um, on his travels and, and research, when he saw the other stages that we'll go on to see in, in just a moment, Sachs, Sachs called this the, the most primitive of, of stages. Um, and what he was comparing it to was, um, <coughs> excuse me, first of all, the French Greek stage, um, where you have bridges, but they're subdivisible. They can operate as, as one, or they can operate as multiple single traps. Um, they, they also had the chariot and pole system that, that Rick mentioned, where you, you have a, a, a carriage in the, the undercroft and the un understage, which then has a pole that can take Siri on it and move on and off the stage. Um, and the German good stage was even more complex, um, where there were, there were three classes of, of traps and, and slopes. Um, and what we're seeing here, and Sachs was, was saying that these more complicated European stages were superior in terms of their functionality and uh, the abilities to, to change scenery than the, the wooden stage that we see in the theatres here. So um, here is a lovely little photograph of the Asphalia system um, where we have dispensed with the wood and we have changed the driving force to be machine rather than human. So going back to the auditorium theatre, um, before you get too excited, unfortunately the stage machinery was removed in its entirety uh, earlier last century. However, not until it had been thoroughly documented, doc documented in uh, drawings of a lot of photography. We're going to look at some of those details now. Um, so here you can see a lovely photograph of a very, very long ramp that was uh, put together um, now these these bridges are we call them elevators in the US, but um, let me try and stick with UK terminology. And um, they're about forty six feet wide, and they are going up to about 13, 14 feet. So what they've done here is they've created this massive ramp from the stage uh, deck level up to fourteen feet, and of course you can see behind that is the wraparound cyclorama, which. Um, was not painted with different uh, buildings or scenes or anything. It was painted with um, multiple instances of different weather patterns so that you could choose whatever weather you wanted and then scroll it through. Your um, so altogether, um, altogether, if we look at this um, overhead plan, um, we have 14 lifts and traps here. Uh, I read kind of that, I think it's actually 15. So downstage, the two circles that you can see very close to the cross arch are in <coughs> the um, are the two star traps. And they're not star traps that we think of for, for pantomime. They are traps for stars um, uh, down, downstage. So there's a little bit of um, convention changing there. Um, then they had a downstage bridge, um, which, which was, was purely up and down. And then following that, there were four main bridges. Now, so they're the ones 46 feet wide, nine feet uh, upstage, downstage. Um, and 
and they were all fitted with smaller central traps. Um, the main bridge, each of those four main bridges, could elevate 13 feet, sink 7 feet. The smaller traps, which are 26 feet by about 4 feet, um, they could uh, sink down to 18 feet, so you could lose a lot more scenery um, on those. And within those, there were tiny auxiliary traps, which were 6 by 4, um, and they could operate within the extents of that parent trap. So there's, there's three levels of traps that you're seeing, and the, the diagram doesn't show the smallest ones. Um, I guess I should have told you that the proscenium width is 75 feet or 23 meters, um, and it's 40 feet high, 12 meters high. Um, the stage size you're seeing there is 100 feet wide by 63 feet deep. Um, in new money, that's 31 meters wide by 19 meters deep. Um, and the grid was a massive 95 feet high, or, or 29 meters at the, at the time. And that cyclorama we talked about, 300 feet of cutaneous canvas that you could scroll around. Parts of the cyclorama do still uh, exist, but uh, they did not operational. So, um, for the remainder of this, there'll be a bit less talking and a bit more looking at um, drawings and, and pictures. Here is a cross-section of the, the theatre as built. This was drawn in 2021. Um, but you can see there, down left, uh, under the stage, the various uh, sections of the, the hydraulic branch. You've actually got a, a mezzanine level and then a basement level down there as well. Um, this is my favourite uh, drawing. This is, this is contemporary to not long after the auditorium opened, and you can see it's a hive of activity. There's actually a rehearsal room way up in the, the uh, up above what we call the gods here, and then on the stage you can see a whole bunch of backdrops and um, scenery on some of the, 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 the bridges there um, ready to, to be used. So this, this shows us just what was going on at the, the theatre not long after it opened. Um, here is a basement plan just to show you what's going on, that, that uh, you've got all those bridges um, on the stage area, and this is it. From why oh, I lost where I am in my notes, but this is this is a this is basically what you see if you went one level down to the mezzanine level and looked up at the the underside of the stage, just to show you the complexity there. You've got sliders just as, like we have here, as we'll see soon. Sliders that are going off stage and then uh, bridges that are coming up with subordinate bridges within them and then within that as well. And um, the four bridges that are on the really big hydraulic rams that you can see are the big circles. Um, like the Drury Lane centre two bridges, those rams could operate independently. So you, you could do the seesawing thing, that's how you saw that, that photograph with the, the ramp effect earlier. So really quite, really quite versatile. Um, next, just a quick look at the site elevation. This shows you much closer detail. Uh, the cross arch is on your right of, of picture. And you can see there that there's a couple of downstage traps that we talked about for the stars. Um, and then there's just a plain um, bridge downstage. And then you've got our four specialist bridges upstage of that. Um, and here's a lovely front elevation which shows us uh, that burrowing down into the subterranean depths that uh, Rick mentioned at Boots Theatre, which was clearly done here to get the, the descent. Um, Chicago was a little bit more boggy than, uh, than New York, so they definitely weren't lasting. And in fact, those of you that have visited this stage of the Auditorium Theatre, uh, it does a great public tour, um, you will see that there's significant settlement throughout the, the building because it was essentially built on a bit of a bog. And those buildings are all, they, they kind of float on um, rafts, they were called, which were a combination of concrete wood and um, part of this building involves a tower and that tower got pretty heavy and so when you walk in when you um, there's like four steps here and three steps on the other side of the lobby it's an interesting place to visit and um, so uh, just rattling through the rest um, we're just going to finish this off with a few pictures a few photographs of all this understage machinery before it got removed um, here you can see the uh, the base of the ram, so this is at the, the very lowest level um, of the understage. 
And uh, there on the left, we've got some of the control levers, uh, which are on the mezzanine level. And then on the right, we're looking at one of the major uh, hydraulic rams. And we're on the basement level. The mezzanine level has a hole in it. And then we're looking up at the other side of, of stage level. Uh, and you can tell that this is the furthest upstage ram because of the drop, uh, the, the backdrop hangers on the rear wall there. Um, so a couple more pictures um, on the left here is again looking at one of the mid-stage rams through the mezzanine and through to the, the underside of the stage floor. And uh, on the right is the star trap with its comedy cartoon lever there. <laughs> Um, I would not want to go up on this, this track. Um, there's no vertical guiding rails. You know, if you're here nine feet below stage on the mezzanine level, you're going up through a hole uh, via hydraulic motive power. If your shoulder's slightly off to the side, then that's going to be pretty sore. The, the hydraulic um, ram is not going to stop unless the person who's operating that is watching very closely. So. I would not fancy going up through the star, the star traps. But anyway, um, so here is uh, the, the auditorium theatre. Um, it's it's an interesting way that things uh, move from the wood stage through to what we have in Europe, and where the Americans saw that they wanted to bring the best of what Europe had to offer to America, and really when it opened, uh, the auditorium theatre was best in class and somewhere certainly was to, to rival New York. Um, so that's where we are with everything. Um, that's all I want to cover with the Auditorium Theatre. Thank you all very much. Season, um, and he was, for some reason, that didn't work out. But 
he was seriously considering uh, emigration to America. He was sort of fed up with the old country. Um, my question is to Mike. I've never quite understood how this hydraulic system works. Once the stage fix has been placed, where it needs to be placed, does the plunger then just go back down? And also, isn't the plunger in the way when you want to sink a whole stage set? So the, the plunger is always attached to the, the underside of the, the track. Um, so, so what you're doing is you're, you're pulling out those sliders and then you're ascending the, the, the lift and then that would stay in position um, until you want to descend uh, from there. The, 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 the rams, the, the plunger would not disappear. Um, and the way that those large bridges were designed was that if, if you think back to that, that front looking section that I had where the, the rams were buried into the, into the ground, the center section, the subordinate, the first subordinate track is then on the center ground. So it can either work in concert, be locked to the, its parent uh, bridge, or it can be used independently um, when it's, and it can raise a lot higher up as well. So you, you, know, you could raise something up on a bridge and then raise the center piece higher. Uh, does that answer the question? Yes. Uh, uh, sad point. I lectured from the stage of the Budapest Opera House before the Iron Curtain came down. <laughs> And I asked about the asphalia system. Oh, that, they said, none of it worked for the last 30 years. We threw it out. So they just thrown it out and put in a terrible, third-rate, Eastern German manufactured flight out. Right, next question. I have one question for each. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Uh, one for uh, Dr. Washington Barrett. Uh, well, when, when, Wendy, uh, if you don't mind. Um, you, you mentioned uh, Harley Mary doing uh, set work for the Edison Company in New York. And I was wondering, uh, because he painted in the English tradition, if you'd compared it with any of the early films that were coming out of Chicago from SNA, which is a very different, uh, uh, very different tradition. Uh, the, the company was founded in 1907, so I, I, I've seen a couple of the productions which look very different from the Edison productions. And I didn't know if you knew anything about the same, the same designers that might have been employed there locally before. Um, uh, what was it, Sossman? Uh, Sossman and Landis. Yeah. So when you think about Sossman and Landis in Chicago, the people who filtered through their shops and those that were trained there went on to found that entire second generation of scenic studios across. So some went to Hollywood, some went to the south, to the north, up into Canada. But SNA had more of a, a continental style that was a bit heavier. And Harley Mary's um, early Edison films weren't necessarily uh, live performances all the time, like the theatricals. Mm -hmm. Some were the, the early films of the amusement park rides, like Fire and Flames, or, yeah. you know, I, the I Trip the flames, to the Moon. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and those were the same designers. And so I, I can't impress enough that there was so much work that it was until World War I friendly competition, and there were also several monopolies going on where there was a no, co where they weren't competing, so the parent company, like Sossman and Landis, would not directly compete. So there's a lot of money changing hands, but it's also, there's so much work that that's why you're constantly, and Grit and I were talking about this, you're constantly shifting the labor pool because you know who paints well with you. You know who can, has certain strengths, like if you're gonna do Grant's panorama out of Chicago. So I, I hope that answers your question. Yes. But, but yeah, Harley Mary's uh, technique, and that's actually why Sossman and Landis didn't settle in New York. There was too much competition. They were the only ones listed in the scenic studio um, directory portion 
when they opened. Well, thank you. Um, and for Mr. Uh, Mr. Boycher, um, I noticed you said that the language describing booths was very much the same in the reports, but in the various newspaper reports that were contemporary with its opening, a lot of the language sounded like a building permit. And I didn't know if you'd consulted the New York City uh, Municipal Archives, because that was the period of the Tweed Ring. And in uh, contractors, con uh, they constantly inflated figures because the larger the permit, the more they have to pay for the permit. So if there were excessive numbers, uh, there would be a greater choice, a better, a greater choice of um, chance, excuse me, for kickbacks uh, to the municipal government uh, because they were robbing the city blind. Uh, and that was right in the heyday between 1867 and 1871 when the ring collapsed and was brought down through examining the municipal accounts by the New York Times. You're, you're getting into a topic that's way above my pay grade. <laughs> I, I, I think there's, uh, there's a lot of work to be done here on so many things, but since we're talking about booths, a lot of work that could be done to kind of recreate what that was, not necessarily because it was a theater, but because of the technical innovations that were introduced there and why. And something, if, if you don't mind me indulging for just a moment, something I forgot to mention. Uh, Booth operated Booth's Theater for five years, and it was a, a financial failure. And so he, he gave it over to uh, some theater operators who operated it uh, up until 1881. And it was a financial failure. And it was taken over by a dry goods store and operated as a dry goods store until 1968, uh, after which time it was uh, torn down to be replaced by a parking lot. So, so there might be some something archival I mean, it did exist for a um, uh, hundred years. So there might be something. There's a lot of research yet to be done on that. Uh, if somebody were to be prepared to take it up. Uh, and then the economic and, the, and this, all of this dynamic, which, which is right everywhere, <laughs> most of the time, kickback, whatnot, uh, could well be part of the story. And the last, very quickly, by uh, Mr. Young. Um, when the equipment was dispersed, uh, from the auditorium, uh, the photographs that were taken. Um, where, was anything of it put into storage? And the other thing is, where was the organ placed? Because I didn't see anything on the plans, and I know there was an extremely large organ by Hilburn Roosevelt, which ended up where I went to school at Indiana University. Uh, it's the foundation of the auditorium organ there. It was quite celebrated. Yeah, the, the, the association uh, came to um, Adler and Sullivan at least six months into their design and said, oh, and we also need the, the world's biggest organ, so just if you can fit that in, please. <laughs> and they adapted, what they did was they took out, um, I, I can imagine this picture, I, 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 uh, maybe if here we can go back a couple of slides to where we see the auditorium. It, it might have, so that, let's see if that holds and yeah, it's gonna fade through. So, so there are the semicircular bit on ju just um, out from the, the stage. Basically the, there is one arch missing there and they took that out to accommodate the organ which they put on the auditorium left side. It's now all covered up, but that's, they had an, an organ chamber on one side only and um, that's where it went on, on the house left. And if you talk to people who sit right down stage in the front orchestra section, uh, it's generally agreed that the acoustics down there, there's some annoying echoes, and they attribute that to the removal of the first archway, uh, which was done to accommodate the, the organ going in, in there. So they made some compromises to get that organ. Um, as for the stage machinery, um, I don't believe any of it was, was saved, and that's why the Historic American Building Society did such a massive job on documenting it. Um, but I have not delved into that. There may be some, you know, Roosevelt <coughs> now own the building. They have 
saved some small parts of it, but uh, that is for another field trip to Chicago, which has not happened as yet. Thank you. Right, more questions down here, please. In the third row, on this side. My question is for Wendy, um, and I'm interested, your gadgets couldn't take his uh, scenery. Um, I wonder if there's a, was, was there a preferred <coughs> scenic workshop that he was using and other British um, uh, companies going over were using, or was it just general, the fact yeah. that they had to recreate everything over there? Well, it was a combination of the two. Stuff would be brought over. Um, and it might be supplemented, but they would also bring over a scenic artist occasionally. And I think it was the loss of work because New York, unlike the Midwest, was very much uh, landlocked in a sense, where there were only so many theaters. And there were an awful lot of artists <laughs> because when, I, um, when you're looking at who's going, and I just used Philip Gocher as an example, who's you know going from the British Isles working in Australia, coming up through San Francisco during the gold rush, going cross country this way, and then settling in New York and doing like Washington and Baltimore. There was competition, but it was like competition within a clique. Um, if you're part of the special kids, which were kind of Harley Mary, and I mean, his two students, this is a little sidestep, Ernest Albert was this scenic artist for the auditorium and Walter Burge was the scenic artist for the Grand Opera House in Chicago. So there was a similarity of styles in a sense. Um, but there is this backlash and it's with once there's like first generation immigrants or the immigrants that come over, they don't necessarily want to lose their work to the next group that comes. Mm -hmm. And between I would say 1870 to the 1880s, there are different companies that are being founded and they are poaching all of the best artists throughout Europe and the British Isles and taking them back over and that does not set very well with people. So in 1885, they even have an American scenic artist show where they also show their work as a whole with both models and fine art and whatnot. And so they band together as a group. There's this uh, patriotic bit where this is my new country, this is my turf. Now, unless you're gonna invest in this country, we don't want you in. And so I, that's kind of what's going on. I hope that answers your question. In the center aisle behind you, that's fine, thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanna go back to the uh, hydraulic rams, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, I'm just curious to know what actually powered the hydraulics? Was it just hand-powered uh, pumps and things like that? Because uh, I report it being quite noisy, uh, uh, all that rumbling and uh, chucking around. And, uh, or did they just ask the, the band to play louder? <laughs> yeah, so, so up on the, the 15th floor uh, of the building where the, the tower was with hotel rooms, there were some huge water tanks up there. Uh, they were specifically for all the other stage machinery also the safety or fire curtain, and there's there's also what we call a reducing curtain in that theater, which is if you've got a smaller show, then they, they had a, a permanent uh, reducer curtain to make the proscenium art smaller. Uh, and by the time, I think it was, uh, the place got used as a, a place for the, the forces, there was, there was actually a bowling alley put into that auditorium uh, at, at one stage. And after the Second World War, the only things that worked were the safety curtain, the fire curtain, and that reducing curtain. Those are now electrically operated. Um, but yeah, it was all it was all water power and huge tides up on the top of the building. I'm beginning to understand why Budapest jumped to the Astoria system. They were an opera house. Now, any more questions? I've got a quick, a quick comment and a question. Um, I think this, well, the situation certainly had changed, I think, in Chicago by 1903, because if I remember correctly, when the Iroquois Theatre burned down, the production they had on, they called Mr. Bluebeard, but it was a version of Bluebeard. 
and it was the cut down scenery because they couldn't bring all the scenery over for Drury Lane. They did bring Drury Lane <coughs> scenery over, but uh, but a reduced amount. Um, so that's that's my comment. I'm here whether you is that is that right? I don't know. Okay. So that's that's the big question. But there's one thing to consider about the Iroquois fire because we keep kind of um, dealing with it. It's not that safety mechanisms weren't available. It was as they were being built, the owners of, of building the theater, and now we're talking butchers and grocers and different businessmen who are funding these theaters. So these are not just entrepreneurs. These are people who want a theater in their community, especially in the Midwest, so that they can bring their culture. So whether it's a Soko Hall with the Czech Slovaks or Sons of Norway, or the Turner Halls for the Germans, it's when you get to the point that the safety mechanisms might be available, but they might not want to invest in that with the idea that the profits are gonna be so large, even if it burns down, you hear businessmen say it now, well, that's what we have insurance for. And that they just don't employ the safety mechanisms in that situation. And I do not think it would have I mean, there were massive fires, starting with the uh, Brooklyn Academy of Music, where you had performers crawling out over the heads of people when that burns down. If, if it had not been wealthy white children at a matinee with people who could actually do something and lobby for a national fire law, I still don't think anything would have happened. And it's just because of the people that got burned up. And with photography, it's similar to social media. There were pictures of the bodies. And there were birthday parties. And, and so that's why it caught the public attention more so. But as far as the cut down scenery aspect and what was being brought over, it's not that it wasn't brought over or that, that ceased, because lobbying Congress only does so much during a particular administration. It's just that when you have the option of bringing something wholesale, it's like purchasing from China. You can get something really, really cheap and you can have it hauled on in or you can actually say, hey, it's made in our country and this is why we want to support it. That's kind of the impetus which was going in. You know someone's always gonna work for cheaper than what you're working for, but if you all game together, it means that you can try to establish some fairness on the board. And I think that's what Harley Mary and the other scenic artists were trying to do, promote a performance and a production standpoint of let's level the playing field as it goes into the Chicago Auditorium of we are not working on a hierarchical <coughs> where you have the poorest people at the top and the wealthiest people at the bottom and you don't want to see each other. It's a different situation where this is intended to gather, just like with how the American cities are laid out once you get west. Um, we are all on an equal playing field and we are supposed to enjoy the same entertainment and that's why we were able to share a similar aesthetic that brought all socioeconomic levels together. Thank you. Oh, my final question. Is it true, Mr. Bacchus, that you recently published a book? <laughs> and where might one get that book? <laughs> Only 25 quid here, and elsewhere it costs you 30 quid. Now, one other thing that uh, occurs to me, when researching New York theatres, I got confused so often because they're so often rebuilt. And I did, it took a long time to realize there are only 10 theatres left in the New York Broadway area which have more than one gallery. They used to be all have many galleries. And they all, the ones left with more than one gallery were built before 1920. So the way things change, um, booze, booze, you know, I'm sure there's so many theatres that have changed that you've got to watch the research because everybody's so proud of making things better but the social question of putting theatres on two levels is also a very interesting aspect because from 1920 onwards it seemed more sensible to mix the classes Right, any more? Please turn up on time because we want to start the um, afternoon session, which is very short.
be a little more than I do. Dead on time, so we don't overrun. So you have time for the machinery. Now, um, Dave Wilmore, do you want to say anything? No. No, good. <laughs> <laughs>